so with this uh, lecture, we fin like with the last lecture, we finished essentially um, the structural uh, notions connected to the class of bound expansions, so all those weak coloring numbers, um, neighborhood complexity, low tree depth colorings, and so on. They will be recurring all the time. Uh, in the next lectures, but now we go a little bit further in the following sense that instead of focusing on classes that are, have bound expansion, we will focus on classes that are nowhere dense. And we will uh, develop some tools for those classes that will be somehow substantially different uh, conceptually from the tools for, for classes of, of bound expansion. And the most uh, important one will, the, will be the one that we will be talking about Today, namely, it will be called uniform quasi quasi white. Uh, this um, seems scary, uh, the, the name, and the definition will be scary as well, but we will try to go through it slowly in order to, to understand uh, it, it better. Good, so the first idea behind uniform quasi whiteness is that. Um, how you can view sparse graphs, namely the basic intuition is that if I have a huge sparse graph, then in a huge sparse graph there should be many vertices that are far from each other. Is this intuition really true? What do you mean it depends? Do you see any counter example of this intuition? A star. A star, yes. So the intuition is is that in a large graph, large sparse graph, I have many vertices far from each other. And the problem with this intuition is that in sparse graphs, we, we might have vertices of, of large degree. Maybe there is not so many of them, but even with one vertex of large degree, I may have a situation where I have a huge star in which every pair of vertices are at distance two from each other, right? But the intuition is here that maybe we can fix this problem in a very naive way. Namely, if I have this one center of the star is just one vertex. It's like a hub in this graph that roots all the connections. So maybe we can just remove this vertex. And once we remove the center of the star, we end up with many vertices that are at distance infinity from each other. Yes? So many vertices that are far from each other. And that's exactly what we will be trying to do today. Namely, we will try to define sparse graphs as graphs where we can delete a small number of vertices in order to find many vertices far from each other. Okay, so now we try to formalize this intuition. And uh, to formalize this intuition, firstly we will think about not removing the vertices at all. So we will actually end up with classes with bounded degree. And for this we will define classes that are uniformly wide. So first I will write one definition, this will be an informal definition, and then we will make it formal. So the informal definition is as follows, that a class C is uniformly wide if for every graph in my class, uh, sorry, okay. And every, let's write it, huge um, subset of vertices A, there is a large subset B such that vertices of B are 
far from each other. Yeah, so the picture is as follows. I've got a huge graph in my class, and I've got a huge set of vertices A. Yes, and if this set of vertices is sufficiently large, then I will be able to find some large subsets B, such that vertices of B are far from each other. Yeah, that's the intuition. Uh, so this saying that this is uniformly wide and not, not just wide, this is not this 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 boils down to saying that it's not that if a graph is sufficient, sufficiently large, then I can find many vertices. But even if I have a graph and any subset that is sufficiently large, it, within the subset, I can find many vertices. Yes? So this uniformly stand, stands for this choice of subset. Yeah? So this is an informal definition because, well, these um, things that I wrote in colors, in red, blue, and green, yes? These were not defined formally. What does it mean large and huge? Yes. What does it mean these vertices are far from each other? Yeah. But that's the intuition. So now let's try to make this definition formal. Now this is the definition of uh, uniform wideness. OK, so C is uniformly wide. If, well, first I need to understand what does it mean far from each other. And what does it mean far from each other? We already know how to quantify this in sparsity, namely if for every distance r. Yes? And then we will, far will be a distance more than r from each other. Yeah? Then there exists a function. I will call it an R. This is a function from natural numbers to natural numbers. So what is this function? Well, this huge and large means that if I want to have a large subset of vertices, I need to start with a huge graph, with a sufficiently large graph. So this is a function that will tell us if I ask for m vertices in B, m vertices that are far from each other, then I need to take at least an R of m vertices in A. Yeah? So this is the function that quantifies what does it mean sufficiently large. Yeah? So, so there is a function such that for every graph G in my class and every subset of vertices, of its vertices, such that the size of A is, say, at least an R of M, where M is my what I ask for, so this large, yes, there exists a subset B of A of size at least M, yes, such that B is distance are independent in G. Yeah, so if I take a graph from my class and a sufficiently large set of vertices A, within the set of vertices A, I can find a set of vertices B, which is as large as I wanted in the, in the beginning, yes, and where the vertices from B are pairwise at distance more than R. Yeah? So this is the definition of uniformly wide, and this is exactly the formalization of this, into, of this informal definition. So as you see, stars are not uniformly wide. Yeah? Because in a large star, I have a large set of petals of the star where the vertices of the, of the petals are pairwise at distance two. So it is a huge set in which I cannot find more than one vertex Yes, in a two distance independent set. Distance two independent. Okay? So in fact, and this we will prove during the tutorials, and this is a, a quite an easy lemma, that a class C is uniformly wide 
if and only if C has bounded maximum degree. Yeah, so in other words, there is a universal upper bound, I don't know, 100 on the maximum degree of all the graphs from C. And this is kind of expected, yeah, because if the degrees may be as arbitrarily large, then I have in my graph arbitrarily large stars, and then this uniformness gives a counterexample. And otherwise, it is easy to prove, and this we'll do during the tutorial. Yeah. So, the definition of uniform wideness so far is not what we wanted, because we want a more robust notion of sparsity. Yes? So now we try to formulate this idea of removing one vertex or few vertices to make uh, this definition work better. And I think that I will do it by not writing it again, but actually taking these two definitions yes, and uh, modifying it a bit so that I will get the definition of uniform class wideness. So what's the intuition? So a class of C is now uniformly quasi-wide. Yeah, so this quasi will encompass uh, this, this, this idea that I can remove a small number of vertices. If for every graph from my class and every huge subset of vertices, there is a subset B, but there is also there is a also a tiny set set S and a large subset B, say this joint in from S, so that the vertices B are formed from each other in G minus S. Yeah? So now I just amended this definition by saying that instead of just requesting that B is and distance are independent, or vertices of B are far from <coughs> each other, I say that vertices of B are far from each other after removing from my graph a tiny set of vertices. Yeah? And this corresponds to removing the center of the star. So now how do we fix <coughs> sorry? So how do we fix the the formal definition of this? So this is then a uniform quasi wideness. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, the picture is that, yes, here I've got A, here I've got B, and in order to make B independent, I can remove a tiny number of vertices in my graph. So how do we fix it? So a class C is uniformly quasi-wide, yes? If for every R, maybe I will write here, there exists, Apart from saying that there is a function that says how large A needs to be in order to find a large B, yes, I need to also quantify how many vertices I am allowed to remove in S. Yes? So instead of just saying that there is a function, I will also say that there exists also a constant, constant usually it's called SR, which is an upper bound on the number of vertices I am allowed to remove. Yes? And a function like that, such that for every m, this is the request of how large uh, set independence that I, I, I want to have. For every graph in my class, for every subset of vertices that is sufficiently large, there exists a b, but not only a b, there is also s, a subset of vertices, of size at most SR, and a B that is disjoint from S of size at least M, such that B is distance R independent now in G minus S. Yeah? So this is again amendment of the formal definition by saying instead of just asking for many vertices that are far from each other, I ask for many vertices that are far from each other after removing a tiny number of vertices a tiny number of vertices which is a constant depending only on the radius I ask for. 
observe that the number of vertices does not depend on m, the size of the independence that I'm requesting. It will be really a constant depending on an r. And this will be somehow important in the application. OK, have you uh, seen such a statement already before? Problem three in last homework. Yes, if you are trying problem number three in the last homework, this was exactly the question of proving that class of bounds expansion are uniformly quasi-wide with a certain uh, parameters uh, that depend on uh, the weak coloring numbers. Because you can do it using weak coloring numbers for classes of, bo of bound expansion. But what, what we will now prove, and this is now, I can upgrade this to a theorem, that a class of graph is uniformly quasi-wide if and only if C is lower than. So this is a little bit surprising, yeah, because uh, on one hand, like we defined lower denseness via exclusion of shallow cliques of minors, of as shallow minors, which seems like a completely different characterization than that. And it turns out that actually the two concepts are exactly the same. Yeah. So this proof is not that easy. It's not that hard either. And we will spend the rest of this lecture proving this theorem. Yeah? So as usual in such proofs, one implication will be sort of easy. <coughs> the implication, if I'm uniformly quasi-wide, then I'm nowhere dense. Because the contrapositive, if I'm somewhere dense, then I'm not uniformly quasi-wide. And we can find nice obstacles for, for somewhere denseness, for being somewhere dense. Uh, the proof that every nowhere dense class is uniformly quasi-wide will be the difficult part. But I think that uh, even though it will require a few steps, I think that it will be modularized enough so that it's, 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 it's just a combinatorial proof. And there will be a lot of uh, Ramsey theory inside. OK, I'm already spoiling the proof. So let me proceed now to the easy part of theorem. So uh, the proof of the easy direction. Okay, so the first lemma, which will be the easy direction, is that if C is uniformly quasi-wide, I will write this abbreviation because this is a really long, uh, long term, then C is nowhere dense. Okay, the proof. All right, so what do we uh, need to show if I want to prove that the class is, is nowhere dense? I need to prove that it doesn't have large clicks as shallow minors. Uh, I can use the fact that uh, topological nowhere dense is the same as nowhere dense, so I need to exclude large clicks as topological shallow minors. Yeah? So let some kt be a depth r topological minor of a graph C such that G is in my class. Yes? So now I need to <coughs> prove an upper bound on T. Yes? If I prove an upper bound on T, depending on, the, on these parameters that govern the uniform plus wideness of C, then I'm done. Yes? So suppose that C is uniformly quasi wide. And this gives me those constants SR for all the R's and these functions and R for all the R's. Just uh, to point out, so I think that the nomenclature, it's, it's, not really, it's not really well established, but I think it makes sense to call these numbers margins because this is like a margin how many vertices, how many small, small number of vertices you need to remove from a class to get, uh, to get uh, many vertices far from each other. And these functions r n, they're maybe sometimes called the wideness functions. <coughs> because they say, how wide is the class in the sense that how, how, how many vertices you need to pick in order to find many vertices that are far. 
Okay, that's, that's just maybe. Okay, so the margins are SR and the wideness functions are NR. Okay, so I've got this, let's say phi is a topological minor model <coughs> of KT in G. And the picture looks like that, this is G. And here I've got this, this topological minor model, say on five vertices, and here are paths that are disjoint. They connect those principal vertices of this minor model. Um, and they are of length two r plus one, yes, because we are topological minor models. So the length will be like two times r plus one. Okay, so these are many vertices that are pairwise connected to each other via short connections and short disjoint connections. They should create a counterexample for lower for uniform quasi wideness. So suppose that my t is larger, let's say larger or equal than n two r plus one of um, 2s plus 2, where this s is just s 2r plus 1. This is just a number depending on the class. Suppose that my topological minor model is super, super large with respect to this, uh, these parameters governing the uniform point y. Yep. OK, so if my t is so large, then if I pick as my A in the uniform of, in the definition of uniform quasi-wideness, if my A will be those principal vertices, yes, then by uniform quasi-wideness, I can obtain that there exists a B in A, and there exists a subset S of vertices of size at most S, and size of B is at least uh, is at least 2s plus 2, yes, such that b is distance uh, 2r plus 1 independent in g minus s. Yeah, that's just the definition. Yeah, so what does it mean on the picture? This means that I can remove a small number of vertices, s of them, Maybe this one, yes? So that after this <coughs> removal, or maybe I will write, I will draw one more guy. Uh, so that after this removal, yes, I can find a large set that is, that is pairwise independent, that is pairwise at, at large distance. Okay, so if I now remove the first vertex from S, the second vertex, each removal, in each removal, I can either remove one of those principal vertices of this topological minor model, or I can remove one vertex from some connection between two. But each removal, therefore, affects only one or two of those principal vertices, either the one that is removed or the two that are connected by this connection. Which brings us with that in S, because S is of size 2s plus 2, this means that two vertices of, uh, sorry, b is of size 2s plus 2, two vertices of b are not affected by removing s. In the following sense, there are two vertices in b, yeah, such that neither of them was removed nor the connection of between them was hit by the set S. Yeah? Because every hit by the set S either removes a vertex or destroys one connection between two vertices. Yeah? But this is a contradiction because they are at distance at most to R plus one because this connection from the topological minor model is preserved. Yes? Okay, so that was easy. Usually proofs, uh, because contrapositive of this is if the class is somewhere dense, it is not uniform in class Y. Usually these proofs are simple because you just take a 
topological minor model of a clique and you show that yeah it it is that yes in the in the sense that we are investigating now good so this was the easy connection and now we are proving the difficult connection i guess that the definition i hope that you already is already imprinted in your brain <coughs> And we can move to the to the main proof of today. So the main proof is uh, is the following lemma: if C is nowhere dense, then C is uniformly positive. Okay. So what do I need to prove? I have a nowhere dense class, and I need to prove that if I, if I take a graph from my class and a very huge set of vertices, I can find many vertices that are far from each other. Maybe on the way I can remove some vertices from the graph. Yes? So if C is nowhere dense, then uh, it has bounded uh, like a topology, uh, this um, sizes of clicks found as, as depth minors are bounded. So, so let's say that t is a function from natural to natural such that kt of r is not a depth r minor of any g for any graph from my class. Yes, I can find such a function. It's just this, uh, I can take t of r be equal to this omega r of the class plus one if you like those parameters, uh, omega r. Yeah, but uh, the, for every r there exists a t such as this code, t of r. Yeah, so let me just fix this for the notation. So what's the proof idea? I get a graph from my class and a huge subset of vertices a. So at the beginning, I've got my graph G0 equal to G and my set A0 equal to A. So this set A0 is distance zero independent. Yeah, every set of vertices is distance zero independent, right? So what we will try to do in, in order to get a a set that is distance r independent, we'll start with a0, which is distance 0 independent. Within it, we'll find a large set of vertices that is distance 1 independent. Then within it, a large set of vertices that will be distance 2 independent, and so on and so on, r steps. Yeah? So we will dig this independent set by making the distances one larger at a time. At every time, we will lose a lot of vertices, but if we start with very many vertices in the beginning, we will end up with at least m vertices at the end. Yeah. So more precisely, from this G0, yes, we will in the first step get a graph G1 and a subset of vertices A1. Such that A1, so this is distance 0 independent in G0, and A1 should be distance 1 independent in G1. Yes? And G1 will be just nothing else than G0 minus some S, <coughs> uh, let's call it S0. Yes? So G1 will be obtained from G0 by removing a small number of vertices. Yes? Then from G1, we will construct G2, which will be just G1 after removing a small number of vertices and the subset of vertices A2, which will be distance 2 independent in G2. Yeah? I hope that you see where this is going. Dot, 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 dot. At the end, we will get GR equal to GR minus 1 minus SR minus 1. Yes? And a subset of vertices AR, which should be distance R independent in GR. Yeah? And this will be our set B. 
<coughs> that I get at the end. And this will be like the set S that I remove from my graph in total will be just the union of all the S's. S1, S2, up to SR minus 1. Yes, so all the vertices that I remove on the way, I will remove. Is this clear? That we will do it step by step? So at the end, what I want is I want that this has size <coughs> and R has size at least M. So let's call it MR. And now in the construction, we will prove what we will prove is that if we want AR to be at least MR, then AR minus 1 will need to be at least MR minus 1, which will be some function of MR. Yes? So in the sense that in this last step, we will, what we will say is that if AR minus 1 is sufficiently large, then I will be able to find AR of size MR. Yes, so this function will govern how large MR minus 1 needs to be in order to get enough vertices at the end. And from MR minus 1, I will get a lower bound MR minus 2 on how large AR minus 2 needs to be, and so on, and so on, and so on, up to M0. Yes, M0 will depend on M1, yes? And this will say how large this initial set A0 needs to be in order to get M1 vertices here. And this M0 will be just our NR of M. Because if the initial set A is of size at least this, then all this chain of reductions, yes, of steps will be, uh, we will be able to execute. So that's the plan. And as you will see, essentially every step of this chain of lower bounds will be another explosion. So this and R of M, at least from the proof that we will show, is, will be a pretty bad function. So that's, that's the idea of the proof. So what we will do now, we will first give the first step from zero independent set to the one independent set. Then we will show the second step from one independent set to two independent set, and then the proof will go by induction. Actually, this will be true in the sense that uh, when I show case from zero to one, all the cases from even to odd will follow the same way. And when I will show case from one to two, all the cases from odd to even will follow in the same way. Yeah, so these are two distinct simple cases that immediately will lift to the general case. Good. So the plan for now is to prove the case from A0 to A1. So in a large zero independent set to find a large one independent set, which is just an independent set. And as you might expect already in your heads, the main tool that we will use here will be the Ramsey theorem. So let me now just recall the Ramsey theorem just to be on the same page and even prove it. So um, Ramsey theorem says the following. So let A, B be integers. Then there is a number, the Ramsey number of a b, such that every uh, click uh, of size at least r of a b with, vert with edges <coughs> colored with two colors, Red, let's say red and blue, and blue, is this really blue? Blue, okay. Uh, has a red click of size at least A, or a blue click of size at least B. I hope that all of you have seen a statement like that before in your life. 
So I will prove it. Just to do for a difference something easy on this on this course. <laughs> um, so what we will prove is actually that we will be able to have r of a b equal to r of a minus one b plus r of a b minus one. So this will be the recurrence that will govern those numbers r of a b for us. And if you notice, observe that r of a one and r of 1a, I can put to 1. Because if I ask for a click of size 1, it is always there if I have a 1 vertex. Yeah? So these two things, if you do the maps, give you r of a, b equal to a plus b minus 2, choose a minus 1. Yeah? So this will be the actual Ramsey number. Yeah, so for at least for two colors, you can write it. Um, so what's the proof? Let's take this <laughs> complete graph on r of a, b vertices, which is r of a minus 1, b, plus r of a, b minus 1. So let me take any vertex, call it, say, u, and it has some red neighbors. And the remaining guys are its blue neighbors. Call it A and B. So what do I know? I know that the total size of the vertex set, R of AB, equal to that, is the same as 1 plus the size of A plus the size of B. So this equality implies that either A is at least that, or B is at least that. Because if both of them were strictly smaller, then they would be strictly smaller by at least one. So in total, A plus B would be at most this plus this minus two. And I've got minus one only. OK, so what happens if in this case? In this case, I've got in my A either a red click of size A minus 1. But then I'm, I'm, I'm happy, because to this click, red click of size A minus 1, I can add the vertex U and get in the graph <coughs> a click of size A, which is red, or a blue click of size uh, b. But then I'm also happy, yeah? It's already there, what I want. Yeah? And the second case is analogous. And this concludes the proof. OK, so that's, uh, that's a simple proof of Ramsey's theorem. And the Ramsey's theorem Uh, extended variant that we will also use is that I can also have many more colors. Yeah? So here I used only two colors, red and blue. But I can also, if I have k colors, let me write it like that, that if I have a complete graph colored with k colors, with edges colored with k colors, there exists a number r of a1, a2, up to ak for any numbers a1 up to ak. So that if I find, take a graph, a complete graph colored with k colors, edge colored with k colors, with the, at least this many vertices, either I find a monochromatic click of the first color on a1 vertices, or a monochromatic click on a2 vertices of the second color, or a monochromatic click of a3 vertices on the first color, and so on and so on. Yes? And the proof is that it is an easy induction. Using the two-color variant. Because what you do, you essentially first think that let me divide the colors into the first color and all the remaining colors treat as one color. Yes? So then I find either a large click of the first color, I'm happy, or a large click of vertices where the, no edges have the first color between them. 
Yeah, so within this click you again apply this the, the, the color variant to extract the second color, and so on and so on. Yeah? So that I will not write even what is the what is the Ramsey number that I get, but actually it's not that bad either. Assuming the number of colors is small. Okay, so now with the Ramsey theorem already here, I can do the lift from here to here. Yeah. So, okay, maybe I can remove it. And as you will see, this list is actually just Ramsey theorem in a sense. So, from A0 to A1. So what do I have? I have in my graph a set of vertices A0, which is zero independent, so there is no constraint between them. Yeah? And I need to find a distance one independent set, which is just an independent set. Yeah? So look at A0, yes. Suppose that size of A0 is at least M0, which will be M1 plus T of 0 minus 2, choose M1 minus 1. And apply Ramsey to the subgraph induced by A0. Yes, I just look at those vertices and I apply Ramsey there. And I apply Ramsey to the color there is an edge and the color there is no edge. So this is a variant of Ramsey which says either there is a click on T of zero vertices or there is an independent set on M1 vertices. So can this happen? It can't. It can't. Yeah, because this, like T0, was the number such that KT0, yes, was not a zero shallow minor, which is just a subgraph, of any graph from my class. Uh, no. Yeah? So this cannot happen. Which means that this happens. I find a large independent set of size M1 in my set A, A0. So this means that we will have M0 equal to, well, equal to that. So if we define M1, we will be able to find a lower bound on M0 that we will need at the end. Okay, so now that here, we have not removed any vertices, yes? So actually S0, the set of vertices I remove in the first phase is empty. I will not remove any vertices when going from a zero, distance zero independent set to distance one independent. And this will happen also for the even, uh, for the even steps as well. Like from even to odd, I will also not remove any vertices. In the odd steps, I will remove some. Okay, so this was the case from A0 to A1. Okay, so now we make the step number two. From A1, we want to get A2. So now I've got a large distance one independent set. So just a set of vertices are pairwise and adjacent. And I want to find a large distance two independent set. Okay, so let's pause for a minute and think what we are trying actually to do. We've got a large graph. And we've got many vertices, this is why I said A1, that are pairwise non-adjacent. And within them, we want to find many vertices that are pairwise at distance more than two. So what does it mean more than two? More than two means 
they do not have common neighbors. Yeah? So now we want to find many vertices in here, so that no two of them have a common neighbor. So let, let's call it H be a bipartite graph that on one side has these vertices from A1 and on the other side it has, let's call it D, this is just the neighborhood of A1. So all the, all the neighbors of guys from A1. So in this graph H, these guys from A1 are already non-adjacent in my graph. So the only thing that I need to, to find is a subset of A1 that is sufficiently large where these vertices that I picked here do not have common neighbors. I may want to remove some vertices from D in order to make them not have common neighbors. And note that now removing some vertices will be necessary because the situation may look like that. that all of these guys from A1 have just one common neighbor. This is <coughs> exactly the start situation. And then we want to remove this guy, put him to S1, yes, and declare that now they do not have any common neighbors. So go many vertices in A1 without common neighbors. Okay, so we will try to dig this subset of vertices in A1 uh, using Ramsey again, in a sense. I will now state a lemma that will be our main uh, digging tool. Uh, we will, uh, you will see how it works and then we will see how using this lemma we will dig this, this set of vertices. Um, so the lemma is stated like that. And this lemma will have nothing to do with any class of nowhere dance, uh, one expansion, it will be just a graph theoretical lemma. <coughs> so, suppose that H is a bipartite graph. Let's call it as the sides, let's call them A and D just to make it clear how they will be uh, used there. Yes? And suppose that A is a size <coughs> at least, uh, I've got some parameters, it will be clearer later on what these parameters mean. Um, the parameter M will be the size of this, of the subset of vertices I look for. The parameter T will be sort of the large, the, a click that I exclude. And I've got also parameter D, which will become clear later. So suppose that R is huge. R is at least the Ramsey number of T, 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 M, where this T is repeated D minus one to two times. So this is the number of colors I will use in my Ramsey. Then, in H, there is either well uh, the first outcome can be a subset let's call it a prime of a without common neighbors <coughs> yeah, so no two vertices of my subset a prime will have any common neighbors second outcome Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Second outcome is a one subdivision of KT with principal vertices 
in, uh, uh, in height. So let's draw it, just to make sure that we understand it. A one subdivision, okay, maybe I draw it here. A one subdivision of kt with uh, principal vertices in A, it looks like that. I draw this principal vertices here, yes? And one subdivision means that between any two of them, I can draw a different path via one vertex from the other side. Yes? So here I've got t vertices, here I've got t choose two vertices that create all these connections between all the pairs of vertices from this kt. Yeah, so this is a, the second outcome. And third is a vertex of degree at least d in d. So a vertex inside here <coughs> that sees a huge neighborhood in a. Okay, so why is this line essentially useful for us? So suppose I've got my graph H that I derived from the situation, I apply this lemma. Yeah? What is the first outcome? The first outcome, we are super happy, yes? Because this is what we want. This is a large subset of vertices that are pairwise do not have any common neighbors. What is the second outcome? The second outcome is a contradiction. Because if I choose T here to be T of one, so, the size of a clique excluded as a depth one minor, yes? then I cannot find such a thing. The third one is a little bit cryptic because what we see from the first is that in D, I can just find a vertex that sees many vertices in A. So far it is not clear what it should give us a priori, but this is a good candidate of a vertex to remove. Yeah, because it creates a lot of connections. Yeah. So what we, the proof we'll do is that, is that we will not apply this lemma once, but we will apply it many times. In the following sense, if we get outcome number three, I will do this uh, again formally later, but I, will, I try to now give this intuition just to, 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 to make you understand how, how the general scheme works. What we will do is that We'll not apply this lemma once, but we will apply it many times. In the following sense, when I find outcome number three, I find this vertex here of large degree. What I do with it, I remove it from my graph, I add it to my set S, and I restrict A to just this set, to the set of its neighbors, which is large, because I asked for a large <coughs> set of I apply it again with this vertex removed. So again, I can either do this, I can either get this, which will give me the outcome I wanted with a set of vertices being of size one to remove, or this, a contradiction, or again, another vertex that has a large neighborhood. Yeah. So I again remove it and restrict my A to its neighborhood. I do it again, and again, and again. How many times? I claim that this procedure needs to stop after at most t, uh, k time, uh, after at most t times. Why? Because if after t times I get here, what is left from A is a set of size at least t, and here I manage to extract T guys that were all, always neighbors of those, then this is a KTT, which contains KT as a one shallow minor. So the iteration, <coughs> so the argument will stop after at most the iteration. So this was so far informal uh, statement of what will happen. This will be formalized later. And now we proceed to the proof of this lemma. So uh, now I will prove this lemma. And then after I prove this lemma, I will make this iteration more formal. 
but I hope that the idea of, of digging what we want uh, t times should be sort of clear. Okay, so proof of that. Okay. So I want to apply Ramsey. Well, in my statement there is a Ramsey number, so I should apply Ramsey. Yes, for some number of colors. So first of all, suppose free double <coughs> fold. Yeah, of course, if, I, if in my set D I've got a vertex of large degree, of degree D, then um, I can already conclude with conclusion D, with conclusion 3, and I'm done. Yeah, so from now on I assume that all the vertices of my set D, they have small neighborhoods. They have degree at most D towards A. Yeah? Uh, actually smaller than D. Yeah? So they have at most d minus one neighbors. I will now create a complete graph on A. Yeah, so now a complete graph on A <coughs> with edges colored with one plus d minus one choose two colors. So this will be a special color, I will call it transparent. And this will be d minus one choose two colors. So at the beginning all the edges are transparent. Yes, of my of my complete graph. And now I, I, I do the I do the following. So here is A. I take first vertex of D. Say U from D. I look at its neighborhood, yes? This is a neighborhood of size at most d minus <coughs> 1. What I do, I take all the pairs, all the edges of my complete graph that I'm trying to construct now, yes? So all the pairs of vertices inside this neighborhood, and I color them with different colors, with pairwise different colors. So color all pairs in the neighborhood of U with different colors. So I'm repainting from transparent to those colors. Yeah? And because this neighborhood is assigned at most D minus 1, I'm using at most this many colors. Yeah? Okay, then I take, let's call it Kim U1, then I take the next vertex from D, Again, look at this neighborhood and do the same trick. Yes? I look at all pairs here. Those pairs that already are assigned colors I leave. Yes? And all the pairs that are so far transparent, I again color using different colors. So all pairs in uh, color all pairs in N of U2, not colored so far. with different colors, yeah, and so on, and so on, and so on, for all the vertices of D. So in this way, I created a complete graph on A with edges colored in that, that color. Some edges are still transparent, yeah, and all the other edges that got colored, they got colored with that many colors in total. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe maybe I will move here because uh, I guess I will be able to finish here. Okay, so now I will try Ramsey. So I have one question. Yes. What if take U three and we have two neighbors in the set of neighbors of U one and two in the set of neighbors of U two, and the edge between them is colored the same way, the same same color? Uh, it's okay. Okay. So it's like uh, so moment. Yeah, so 
I get I take you free. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have its neighborhood. All the pairs that are colored so far, but they, they have the same they may have the same color. I don't care about them. I just take all the edges that are transparent so far, I color them differently. That's the only thing I do. I do not care about the edges here that were colored before. They might have the same color. Yeah, but a good question. That, that was a, a valid concern. OK, so now I apply Ramsey. Yeah? So what can Ramsey give us? So if I apply Ramsey, I know that my size of A is at least this. Yes? So one outcome is a transparent click of size at least M. So then we are super happy, yes? Because a transparent click of size M is exactly outcome number one. Because an edge is, remains transparent at the end, a pair of vertices remains transparent at the end, only if the <coughs> two vertices do not have a common neighbor. Yeah? Because they become colored only when there is a common neighbor to color them. Yeah? So then we have outcome one. So now what happens if I have, uh, say, a click of color, uh, say, I don't know, 10, number 10 of size, at least T. So now what happens? I've got in A this click, this set of T vertices, so that all the pairs between them were colored with the same color in this procedure. But know that in every iteration, when a color is when uh, when I color a pair, all the other pairs colored in this iteration by the same vertex are colored differently. So which means that all the pairs within this click of size t needed to be colored in different iterations. What does it mean that they needed to be colored in different iterations? This means that this pair was colored for that vertex of D. That pair was colored for a different vertex of D. This cannot be the same vertex because then this vertex would color two edges with the same color. This edge was colored with another vertex. And this with another, and so on. And we get outcome number two. Yes. And we are done. That's the end of the proof. Because Ramsey gives either that or that for one of the colors. Good. So this is the this is the proof of the lemma. And now uh, I want to use the lemma to to lift this to um, to digging this structure in this in this graph uh, to, to to giving the case from a1 to a2. And maybe I will. Uh, have this, this lemma statement still there, I will wipe out now the proof and give the next lemma here that will be that will encompass the iterative application of that one. So the lemma says the following lemma. So again I've got a K H a is a bipartite graph, bipartite graph, uh, sides <coughs> A and D. Um, I now only need those parameters M and T. Yeah. And I assume that A is larger than, I will call it our star of T, T, M. I will define this function in a moment. This will be an iterative that runs a number. <coughs> that, uh, yeah. Then, um, in H, there is. Okay, so outcome number one will be a little bit unbended. 
a subset i prime of a that has no common neighbors outside a set of size, a set s of size at all. Uh, yeah, so now I want to have a subset of vertices without common neighbors, but I allow removing a small number of vertices. Second, again, a one subdivision of KT. And the third outcome now will be the end product of this procedure if it reaches a contradiction, which will be KTT. Yeah? So that's, uh, that's the statement of the lemma. <coughs> um, and I need to say what is this R star. So R star of say STM will be defined as follows. So this will be the the lower the Ramsey lower bound for when I have S iterations left. So this will be T if S equal to zero. So this corresponds to the fact that I need to end up with T vertices here in order to apply to say that I've got the KTT. And then I've got R the Ramsey number of T, 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 M. And this T is repeated R star of S minus 1 T, M. But uh, actually, not this, but this minus 1 just 2. Yeah? Well, that's an inductive definition of a function. So you see a, quite a blow up here of the, of the complexity of all these functions, because it's not just Ramsey applied to Ramsey. Yeah? This would be not so bad. This is a Ramsey applied to the number of cores, which is a previous Ramsey number. And this is repeated t times. Okay, so this is the definition, and now we prove this lemma. Okay, so let's uh, make the first step. So I've got the size of A, yes, is at least R star of T, T, M, yes, which is uh, exactly this Ramsey number, yes, T is repeated D times, or D minus 1 choose 2, where D is equal to the previous Ramsey number. Yes? So now apply the previous lemma. Yeah? So from the <coughs> application of the previous lemma, I either get what? A subset of, of sufficiently large size without common neighbors. I'm golden because I reached this contradiction. Yes. Or a one subdivision of a KT. I'm again happy. Yes. Or, well, I get a vertex in D of degree. What degree? Well, actually that. Yes? of degree at least r star of t minus 1 t m. Let's call it u1. Yeah? So now restrict to the neighborhood of u1 and iterate. So let's look at the picture. Yes? Do we have 2 to the t? Uh, sorry. This was a times, not a wiped out uh, completely. So this is just this number that we wanted here for d, the degree, equal to that, <coughs> to the previous iteration. Yeah? So, so now we restrict to, to the neighborhood of u1 and we iterate. 
Yeah, we apply the same. So what we get? We start with a large sub A. In the first iteration, either we conclude or we find a smaller set. So the first A was of size at least R of T Tm. The second is of size at least R of T minus 1 Tm. And it is seen by U1. Yes? The next A in the next iteration will be of size at least R of T minus 2 Tm and will be seen by the next vertex, and so on and so on, up till I get here R of 0 Tm, which is exactly T, at least, and here I produced T vertices. That all see this remaining part. And then that's case T. Yes. Observe that if I get at any point in my application of lemma 1, I get the subset of vertices without common neighbors. It is a subset of vertices without common neighbors after removing all these vertices u1, u2, ui in the previous iteration. Yes, so indeed I can remove a number of vertices and then conclude with a large set of vertices without common neighbors. Yes? Good. So that's the proof of this lemma. And now we can get back to the case of the step from A1 to A2. Yeah. So recall that what we had is this bipartite graph between A1 and D, which was the neighborhood of A1. And what we wanted, we wanted here to find many vertices without common neighbors, <coughs> possibly after removing a small number of vertices. Yes, and this graph is called H. Yeah. So now, suppose that A1, and this will be, will be of size at least M1, which will be our star of T, T, M2. Where now T is T of 1. So the size of a click re, um, excluded as a one shallow minor, as a depth one minor. So apply lemma two. Lemma two. Okay, so what happens <coughs> if I get outcome number two? It's okay. What do you mean it's okay? It's not okay. It's contradiction. It's contradiction, yes. So outcome number two is a contradiction. Yeah, because this is a one subdivision of of kt in my graph, which is also a depth one minor. What happens if I get outcome free? The same. The same. Also, I've got contradiction. Because a ktt contains kt as a one shallow minor. And what happens if I get one? You produce kt. Hmm? Yes, we get, we get a2. Yes, we get A2, but also we get the, 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 the set of vertices we remove. Yes, we, whose size is at most T, which is T of 1. Actually, it is smaller. Yep. So observe that the sizes of sets that I removed are actually pretty small. They are just the sizes of excluded peaks. Yes, it is the... Uh, the relation between M1 and M2, which is Gary and one Okay, so we did step from A1 to A2. Okay, so now let's proceed by induction, right? So let me show you how to do step from A2 to A3. 
by using the step from A0 to A1. Um, maybe I will even leave it here. A2 to A3. So how in a large two independent set find a large three independent set? What is a two independent set? Um, a set is two independent in a graph if the vertices are a distance more than two from each other, which is equivalent to saying that if I draw balls of radius one around them, then these balls are disjoint. <coughs> yes? And if I now want to find subset of vertices, which are a distance, which are free in the distance free independent, this means that I would like to find a subset of those balls, which are pairwise non-touching, non-adjacent. Uh, non yeah? So what I do, from my graph, uh, now it's actually called G2, I create a one shallow minor G2 prime by just taking the balls and contracting them. And now, the question of finding a large three independent set in a large two independent set boils down after contraction to finding a large one independent set in a large zero independent set. Which is the question that we actually did in the step A0 to A1. Yes, then, mm, then uh, apply the reasoning for A0 to A1. And you need to be a little bit careful here because, well, in the step A0 to A1, we excluded some click as a that zero minor, yes? So now observe that I do this uh, contraction, so now I exclude some, some click as a, a little bit more deep minor. Yes? But if you look at this more carefully, we need to exclude <coughs> In general, k t i over 2, if I'm doing a step from i to i plus 1 in this way. Because, well, I'm contracting both of radius i half, yes? And then this click is created by taking single vert, like by taking, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually contracting both of, of radius i half, and then I get a click in, 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 in the contradiction part. And step A3 to A4, it's again the same. I again contract balls of radius 1. In general, I contract balls of radius I half. And now I've got balls that are pairwise non-touching, non-adjacent. And I need to find many balls that pairwise do not have common neighbors. Yeah, so after contraction, this is exactly the case from I, uh, A1 to A2. So all in all, uh, I can wipe out this. So you see, it actually worked by magic induction using the two base cases. So all in all, we get the following relation that mi how is related to mi minus uh, sorry m yeah mi minus one let's say. How it is related to uh, to M i? Well, if i is okay, maybe i plus one. If i is even, so k is zero to one, two to three, and so on. Then I just apply roundly, as as in the beginning. So what I get is M i plus one plus t of i half. Uh, minus 2, choose, uh, let's say, mi plus 1. Or maybe I'll do this, the other one. It's more this happens for the even case. Yes? For the odd case, 
what I get is I take this iterated round a number for m i plus 1 and for numbers t of i half rounded somehow and t of i half rounded somehow. Yeah, it's one. Yeah? So this is a relation that gives me how large m i needs to be based on m i plus 1. And in order to get this n r of m, I take m r equal to m. I get from this a lower bound on m r minus 1, a lower bound on m r minus 2, and so on, up to a lower bound on m 0, which will be my final n r. Yeah? So r times I do a blow up by this, by this nasty function. And this concludes the proof. Is this proof sort of clear? OK, it, was, it took us uh, the whole lecture, but I think it's like, actually a very nice combinatorial proof. There, it has many components, and it has a very <coughs> clear structure, in a sense, meaning it can be modularized. So a few last remarks about this proof. So first of all, it is algorithmic. The proof is algorithmic. In the following sense, if I give you a graph from my class and the subset of vertices A, which is sufficiently large, you can do all of this stuff that we did here algorithmically and get a polynomial time algorithm that will find this large independent set and this number and the set of vertices that you exclude. Observe that um, there are some caveats of this, meaning in this algorithm, you need to have numbers these numbers t of i hard coded. So in the following sense, for every class that is nowhere dense, there exists an algorithm. Because this algorithm uses the threshold t of i. It is not oblivious to the to the class on which it is run. That's sort of a copy, but but from a theoretical point of view, yeah, it works in polynomial time. Uh, second, well, the bounds that we got are not that great, let's say. Yeah? So um, one can ask how bad will actually be this nr of m based on m. So if you look at this, this blow up is actually polynomial. Because this blow up essentially says that mi is roughly mi plus 1 to the power t of i half, which is a constant. Yeah? So if I only had blow-ups like that, then actually it will be a polynomial of a polynomial of a polynomial of a polynomial, of a polynomial r times, which for, cost, for fixed class and fixed r gives me a polynomial. With degree depending, of course, on r and the class, but still it, is, it would be a constant. For a, like a, when m is considered the invariant, this this is a bit worse, but actually there is this can be fixed. This can be improved to a polynomial blow. In the following sense, so here we did a sort of <coughs> straightforward proof by Ramsey, by just applying Ramsey after Ramsey, uh, after Ramsey. But if you do this carefully and with many tricks, then you can actually improve this case so that the dependence of mi on mi plus 1 is a polynomial. So it is actually the case that if a class is C is nowhere dense, then C is uniformly quasi-wide with nr of m being polynomial in m, with a degree depending on r and, this, and c. And observe that it is nowhere dense if and only if it is uniform quasi-white. So in the sense, if a class is uniform in quasi-white, then actually it is uniform in quasi-white with a polynomial whiteness function.
that's uh, a little bit curious, and we were <coughs> sort of surprised when you have observed this, but, uh, but this is in the decades, and it is actually very useful, this fact, that these wideness functions are also polynomial. We will not prove this during this course. Uh, we will not give this improvement, but I think uh, just before Christmas, we will go a little bit beyond uh, uniform quasi-wideness to, to some uh, introduction to, to tools from stability, and there you will see kind of tools using which you can do this. So there will be reasonings that will resemble the proof, uh, the proof of this fact in two weeks. I think that's it. Uh, it's almost uh, exactly the time I wanted to spend on this. Uh, so we see each other uh, on the tutorials uh, quarter past uh, two.